Hello, welcome everyone to December's uh, POCUS Collaborative um, tutorial. So today we're talking about um, Echo and Tampanade, a bit of a recap of the basic 2D stuff and um, some more advanced Doppler um, applications in Tampanade. And then Keir McDermott will be talking to us about um, the IVC. So uh, I've used quite a few different YouTube videos and resources here. There's a QR code for an excellent uh, ultrasound podcast that uh, I recommend you listen to. And I've um, taken some information from, so do have a look at that. Um, so we're going to talk about fusion. So if you've listened to my previous talks on Echo, I go through a point of care ultrasound system um, for Echo, which consists of the five E's. So five E's, so entrance is the IVC ejection, corresponds to the left ventricle ejection fraction or systolic function. Um, the third E is equal ventricle. So does the RV look similar to the LV or is it smaller as it should be? Is it bigger as it shouldn't be? Fourth E is exit. So that um, means the aortic route, is it structurally normal? Um, is the anatomy disrupted? And uh, fifth E is effusion. So we're talking about um, effusions today and effusions can be pericardial or plural. So that's where our first issue lies. So here we've got an echo. Uh, so this is a parasternal long axis view and we've got some fluid around the LV. Um, so if you have a look here, we've got our LV here, we've got a right ventricle outflow track there, and this black, um, high, well, anechoic area is fluid. So um, on this view, that could be pericardial, it could be plural, and we use this here as our landmark to try and differentiate the two. So this is our descending aorta. So um, this is actually not tamponade. Um, so I just want you to be familiar with this. This is a pericardial effusion, and we'll talk about why in a second. Um, and you'll see a little bit of sort of bouncing of this free wall of the RVOT at the top, um, but this is not diastolic collapse. I just want you to um, have a, a look at that. This is a quite happy heart in a sack of pericardial fluid. Um, and there just is a little bit of free wall bounce there, but not diastolic collapse. So we use the descending thoracic aorta as our landmark. And if we have fluid coming up to it or that anechoic area coming up to it, but dropping down posterior to the descending aorta, that is plural fluid. If it's coming up anterior to the thoracic aorta, so this is, um, the anterior chest wall, so closest to the probe, that is a pericardial effusion. It tends to come up to a point um, just below the left atrium. Um, so that's the way to differentiate between the two. And if you're really unlucky, you might have both. So um, these two are two separate ones. So this is a pericardial effusion coming up to a point above or anterior to the thoracic aorta. And here is a pleural effusion um, abutting but dropping down um, posterior to the thoracic aorta. And so what's this one? So it says pericardial effusion at the top, but I want you to have a look and see what you think. Um, and do put any thoughts in the chat. So pericardial or plural, or is it both? So we've got this big anechoic area down here, and that's abutting this descending aorta, but it's dropping down below. So that would suggest that's plural. However, we do have this smaller sliver of fluid that's about maybe half a centimeter and um, that's coming up anterior to the thoracic aorta. So this is pericardial. So this unfortunate cell has both a plural and a pericardial effusion. Okay, so here again, we've got both. This is a pericardial and this is a plural here. The pericardial fluid is a little bit more. So it's pushed that plural fluid away from the descending aorta. And then we go to measuring the effusion. So um, it will collect in different areas. And one of the things we're gonna go through about how you comment on effusions is um, discussing the distribution, uh, but generally measure wherever the widest point is, describe where it is and just measure perpendicularly across um, and, usually just at the point that it's biggest. Um, and also just comment on whether you think it's loculated, whether there are fibrin strands in it. Um, we talk about different sizes of effusion. Uh, generally, I say anything over two centimeters is um, more significant um, and smaller is less significant, but it depends on how quickly it collects. 
So this is really the key here. Um, tamponade is a clinical diagnosis. So um, the gentleman on the, the left there is um, not very well. He's uh, very short of breath, um, hypotensive, tachycardic, and uh, sorry about the clip there. Um, and uh, he will have some clinical signs of tamponade. So he might have Bex triads, a hypotension, a jugular venous um, distension, um, and muffled heart sounds. So uh, this down here is electrical alternance. You might see that ECG tracing showing this respiratory variability there. Um, and then we may see these echo signs as well. But if you don't have a, you can't have B. So um, if you don't have this clinical picture, it is not tamponade. The clinical picture by far trumps any echo findings you might have. So here we've got tamponade. We're going to be talking about this diastolic collapse in a bit more detail. So we've got a subcostal view here with our RV on top. And that RV is struggling to fill in diastole because of this um, raised uh, intrapericardial pressure here. Um, so on the left, we've got some of the ECG findings you might find as part of your um, assessment. So we've got low voltage um, complexes here that could be suggested of tamponade. And we've got um, uh, electrical alternans here below. So echo features of tamponade. So firstly, we need a significant amount of pericardial effusion. So everyone's got some fluid around um, the heart, which allows uh, the visceral and the parietal pericardium to slide over. It's also about um, you know, 50 mils or so. Um, and when that starts to increase, um, you'll start to see a little bit more on echo. You might see an enlarged heart um, on your X-ray. Um, and eventually um, it has the potential to cause some problems, some hemodynamic compromise, and that's all to do with the pressure within that pericardial sac. So if it's very acutely um, collected, such as with trauma, um, bleeding into the pericardial space, um, it, a much smaller amount of fluid is going to be significant as opposed to um, if it's had a longer time to collect. So for example, with an infective or a malignant cause, um, the pericardium has a chance to stretch. Um, so at the point where the right heart struggles to fill, we're going to start to see some of that um, diastolic collapse um, or right atrial systolic collapse, but it's really sort of end diastolic collapse. Um, and it's really important to know the phase of the cycle because it can be very difficult to eyeball what phase of the cycle it is. So I actually recommend you put on telemetry, you put on the ECG tracing at the bottom of your machine if you have it so you can identify the phase of the cycle. So you'll see um, the right atrial collapse around beginning of the R wave here. So right at the end of diastole, beginning of systole, and you'll see the um, RV collapse um, in early diastole, sort of at the end of the T wave, um, and that will allow you to be confident in your interpretation. And here's just another 2D sign, it's called swimming heart sign. So the heart is just moving vigorously within this big sack of fluid, um, and the RV is being compressed there as well. If you could take one thing away from this talk, I would say. Um, look at the IVC. So Kia's going to be talking about the IVC and um, some of the pitfalls and how it's gone out of favour a little bit as well. Um, but in tamponade, it really does have a very good um, negative predictive value if it is collapsible. So it, in tamponade, that pressure is going to back up. Um, and so uh, the IVC should be distended. It shouldn't be collapsing more than 50%. Um, there are some caveats to that. If you have a loculated effusion, if it's post-operative or if the patient is extremely hypovolemic, potentially there could be some collapse there. Um, but I'd say that would be in a very, very small minority in the um, studies that I've seen, quite small studies, um, suggest that 98% um, of uh, patients who have a, a um, collapsible IVC do not have tamponade, so it corresponds quite well. So I just want to point out how you might report your point of care echo. So I use a um, reporting form a bit like this. So if you scan the QR code, you can copy and paste this version. So it always has an indication and a sort of pretest probability. So what is your, uh, what does the clinical picture suggest? Does it suggest it's tamponade or not? And this has um, the report laid out in those five E's. So um, your entrance, your rejection, your 
exit um, your equal ventricles and your effusions. If you want to do a more focused uh, one specifically for pericardial um, tamponade or pericardial effusion, I've laid this out to answer the five questions that you need to ask if you have a pericardial effusion. So this is in patients where you already know there's an effusion and you're looking to see whether maybe they are unwell because of that effusion or could it be another cause of shock? Um, so the five um, questions you're going to ask, which we'll talk about in a second, is, is there um, uh, what, what type of effusion is firstly? Is it pericardial or pleural or maybe both? Um, what is the size of the effusion? Is it, is it of a significant size? Uh, where is it distributed? Um, and that matters because we need to access it to drain it or um, it might be creating more trouble if it's around the RV. And are there any signs of tamponade? So RV diastolic collapse, RA systolic collapse, the IVC and um, is there pulses paradoxes in the transvalvular velocities, which we'll talk about in a second. And finally, can it be drained percutaneously? And then what you really need to write down is what is the patient like? Is the patient behaving in a way that would support a diagnosis clinically of cardiac tamponade? And then obviously your actions. So going back to those questions. So is it pericardial or is it plural? So we've talked about that already. Um, and secondly, size. So um, here is just a, a demonstration of uh, how a small effusion has caused tamponade. So here we've got a patient where um, this effusion looks like it's less than half a centimetre, really. But we've got that diastolic collapse. And some people describe it as, um, you know, a man on a trampoline. Um, so this sort of dipping um, in the middle of that RVOT on this is a... Uh, a parasternal, I think it's parasternal long axis, it's, it's the opposite right way around though, it might be subcostal, I think, sorry. Um, so very small amount of fluid around that um, RV, but it is bouncing there. So this is um, a diastolic collapse. I think we'd try and check that with M mode or potentially with our um, uh, telemetry, but uh, this is worrying even though it's so small. So it's just to, to point out that actually size doesn't matter, um, but I would comment on it. It uh, also gives you an idea about how much you might be draining. So where is it distributed? I say this is most important for if we're planning to do an intervention. Um, so it could be distributed um, anywhere. Generally, it's posterior, um, and that's just because of how the patient is lying down. Um, so it collects um, posterior, so just by the LV there. Okay, um, so uh, this video is just showing um, M mode um, and the use of M mode in uh, assessing uh, where the uh, effusion is. So you can put it across and see the effusion on M mode. It's also useful to identify those um, cycle phases. So uh, we've got some collapse. So if I just put my cursor at the top, so this is our subcutaneous tissue, we've got our pericardial effusion here, this anechoic area at the top. Then we've got the RV3 wall, uh, which is going up and down, up and down. Then we've got um, our septum, and then we've got our intra, uh, left ventricle cavity. So this is um, our mitral valve. It sort of creates a little bit of an M shape. And the mitral valve does this up and down motion in diastole. So wherever we see this M, that's diastole. So we're gonna see how that corresponds to RV um, free wall because it collapses there, collapses there, collapses there. So this is diastolic collapse. So that's, that's quite helpful uh, to help identify the phases. Um, and um, what this uh, image on the left here shows, so this is um, from a 2017 study. Um, it just shows that, uh, with inspiration, um, we have some uh, uh, raise uh, with inspiration, the intra abdominal pressure increases, the intra thoracic pressure decreases, and uh, it augments venous return um, and increased filling to the right heart. So, with expiration, the diaphragm ascends, leading to an increase in uh, intra thoracic pressure and decreases in intra abdominal pressure, leading to a reduction in the systemic venous return and a decrease in the right heart filling. Um, so um, there will be minimal changes in the left heart filling as the intrathoracic pressure changes are transmitted um, uh, if the pericardial it, via the pericardial sac and the pulmonary veins to the same degree. So sorry, to the pericardial um, sac and the pulmonary veins to the same degree. Um, 
so the intrapericardial pressure and the um, intracavity pressure decrease as the intrathoracic pressure decreases. So um, the increased RV filling and inspiration causes the intraventricular septum to bow to the left a little, leading to a slight reduction in the LV filling in inspiration. And so that also leads to a reduction in the stroke volume. So in tamponade, these normal respiratory changes are accentuated. Uh, so with inspiration, the right heart fills more than normal. Um, but the left heart filling decreases more than normal, and that's due to that um, intrapericardial pressure increase, um, interpericardial pressure increase, sorry. Um, so as the, there is decline in um, the intrathoracic pressure, um, it's not fully transmitted to the pericardial sac and the cardiac changes, but it's transmitted to the pulmonary veins as normal. Um, so when we talk about ventricular interdependence during inspiration, the lack of the RV ability to expand into the pericardial sac leads to uh, intravenous and ventricular septum bowing more to the LV, and that reduces the LV filling and stroke volume in expiration. Um, the LV uh, increases uh, filling and um, leads to intraventricular septum bowing to the right, and RV filling is impeded.